Hello, Internet. This would be Chris and Kent coming at you in an attempt to thrill you and chill you with Kent at your own risk, number 10. How are you doing tonight, Kent? I am adequate. Uh, I don't know. I always feel it's, it's weird to say coming at you, but this is a horror podcast. It, it works. <laughs> well, I mean, okay. You just took it to a weird place to start, so. Oh, I took it at a weird place. Forgive me. Well, n- never mind, because <laughs> 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 this, is, this is tended to be a horror podcast and not just a bunch of innuendos. So, in this episode, uh, Kent and I will be discussing four movies, two of them that we chose for the other to watch for the first time, never having seen it. Although one of those two that Kent watched, I've never seen either, so it'll be the first time anyone of the two of us has actually seen that movie. Uh, We'll be going into it, and then a little bit later on, we're going to give you a separate podcast where we discuss our top 10, or top 25 in Kent's case, in which case this would be horror movies that we think would be well-due for a reboot or a remake. So, to start out with uh, Kent, Let's hit the one that uh, you're the only person who's seen. We had uh, Fragile this month. How did that? Right. How was that? Because you said there's some shit to get into with that. Well, ju- just to catch everybody up, because we did all the Game of Thrones stuff. Before we did the Game of Thrones podcast, we did the whole Supernatural movies, and that's where all of these movies are, are coming from, is from those lists. So if you're interested, go back to like episode two. Two, I think it is. I think that one would have been three, three or four. Okay, so there you go. Um, all right, so fragile. I <laughs> I had a journey to find it. Um, I initially couldn't find it. I tried to download it. That didn't go well. Like nothing was going right. And then I found it on Amazon Prime. So it's free on Amazon Prime. And I have to say, I. I, I at first it was cheesy. It, it, Calista Flockhart isn't a bad actress, but there's a, probably like a reason why she hasn't done much. It seems to me, if I may interject, that she's a type of actress who does really well in a certain role and doesn't have very much versatility outside of that. I would agree with that. And having never seen Ally McBeal, but having seen the porn version Ally McFeel. Um, I can't really comment on her acumen, but she she was fine as a lead. Like she didn't bother me. None of the acting bothered me. There is some very thick plot armor uh, throughout the uh, film. Uh, basically, uh, the kid there's this like kids hospital. And bad shit's happening, and the hospital is closing down, so they're slowly moving the kids to this other newer hospital. And for some reason, like, I don't know, it's like off the fucking beaten path. I don't know why you put a hospital, a fucking hospital off the beaten path, but that's what they decide to do. Like, helicopters have to come in and, like, bring them, like, supplies and stuff. But it's not like on an island. I, I don't know how to explain it. It's kind of, I don't know, a little derivative, I guess. But, uh... Like, the opening scene, you see this kid, like, he falls out of bed, and he, like, breaks his leg, and they x-ray him. And then, like, a few minutes later, his leg is shattered in two places, so spooky. We find out, basically, there's a ghost in the hospital. I'm not going to tell you why the ghost is there or who the ghost is, because it's kind of a twist. It's a good twist, Um, but it is a metal lady named Charlotte. Uh... Did you say metal lady? Yes, M E T A L. The the children are fearful of Charlotte. And I will tell you there are two Lin Shay type ladies in the movie that add, you know, the Lin Shay context. Um they must not have had the budget for Lin Shay. Uh this but they were great. Two thousand five, so was that kind of like in her like off time? Ooh, that would have been a little bit before Insidious, I think. And before Insidious, like, Lin Shay wasn't fully known as the tour de force as she is Yeah, I mean, it it had been a couple years between, you know, like, the 80s stuff. I mean, I think probably the last big thing I remember before that that she was in was Detroit Rock City, so. Yeah, so that's something. 
I will say there's a part that drove me fucking nuts and I, I, I like first of all I do recommend this it's, it's like an hour and 40 minutes with credits so hour and 35 um, there's a part where uh, Callista Flockhart's the new night nurse she's dealing with the old nurse like trying to get help because she, they've got to get the kids the fuck out of there basically and on the way back to the hospital, the old ladies, the old older nurse, the experienced nurse is explaining like what truly went down to explain the twist, basically, right? And then they get to the hospital, and Calista Flockhart finds like the head male doctor, and he's watching old video, and he's like, "Oh, okay, so he now knows the story." And then he re-explains the story to Calista Flockhart. It's almost like two different people wrote this because they explain the exact same story twice and like Calista Flockhart does like stop and be like yeah I already got the down low on this hey guess what Cl- they are two different writers credited for writing the movie <laughs> no shit that's funny so they probably both liked how they told the story and like well we're just fucking keeping it then <laughs> that's great <laughs> Seriously, that 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 probably like there's some stuff early on that will make you roll your eyes a little bit, but nothing that you haven't like. It's nothing terribly offensive. Um, and then there's one other scene that drove me fucking nuts. Like everything's going to shit, right? Calista Flockhart's on her way to get the the experienced lady. So you got the uh, Latina nurse who's trying to get like these 10 fucking kids like have various like lung diseases and shit all together so they can leave you have a doctor in the film room just watching this old film and then you have like the the orderly trying to find like a portable air pump thingy for the kid that is like hyperventilating so this one nurse is trying to do everything nobody else is really helping her and then like everybody reconvenes and then they yell at the Latina nurse because she wasn't doing everything fast enough. I was like, what? It, it made no sense to yell at this poor lady who's doing basically everything. With that being said, uh, I don't know. I, I, I feel like a schmuck for saying this. The ending really made me, I don't want to say sad, but like, I, I, I felt like that... I wasn't on the verge of crying, but I was like, oh, that kind of hit me a little hard. Okay, so emotionally sad rather than, like, sad that, like, you watched the movie. Right, yeah, like, I, I was like, huh. Oh. So, it, and I, there's one other annoyance that I, I will say, and it, it's a minor spoiler, but she, Calista Flockhart finds out, like, halfway in the movie, like, once you see this entity, you are going to die, right? Once you see the metal woman, you're going to die, basically. And yet she never acknowledges it until like five minutes are left in the movie. She's like, oh yeah, I saw her. I'm going to die. It's like, yeah, no shit. You've been finding out this information all along, and now you're finally just having this realization, this aha moment. <sighs> With that being said, Calista Flockhart may or may not die. So they may or may not have broken their own rules. So that may or may not have been a spoiler. With that being said, I definitely recommend the movie. Like, I didn't think I was going to like it, and then the ending just kind of left me like, oh. And see, see, that was one of the things when I was reading about the well, a just from reading the synopsis, you can't tell if it's going to be a supernatural movie or if it's going to go into another d- direction, like uh, some movies have done. A I E, if I'm going to spoil it for you, the boy. Uh, <laughs> the fucking boy. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, the premise sounded interesting. And since you tend to find things better than I do, especially, like, shit you have to dig for, I was like, go for it, Kent. Uh, okay, good. That's good to hear, because that was some one of the ones that on the list that I wanted, well, from reading the synopsis of, was interested in seeing. You know, I don't necessarily like Calista Flockhart, but I like Richard Roxborough, and I think that the synopsis sounded interesting. So, good takeaway. Like, what would you rate it if you had to give it a rating? Um, I, I would say it's a solid 6.5. Like, it's not 7 territory, but it's in, in the mid-6s for me. Uh, there's a couple, like, I don't know, people I didn't know, like the Latina nurse. There's a black dude that's really awesome. The two Lin Shay ladies. And then one of the kids named Maggie. I really liked her as an actress. 
Um, I will say there is unexpected nudity at one point. It is not of the pleasant variety, um, and it made no sense, but it's there. Like penises or like... No, no. The, oh. the metal lady, you see her boobs for some reason. There's no rhyme or reason for it. Like, when you get into the story, you'll be like, why did they show that? Like, normally I don't sit there and question why they show tits. No, 110%. You will sit there and go, why? Like, why? Was it Was it like when they... Was it... Was Lin Shay the one whose tits they showed in um, friggin' uh, what was the one with the the hair gel? Oh, something about uh, Mary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that Lin Shay in that? Was that her? I don't know. All of a sudden, I was like, "Wait, wait, hold on." <laughs> it was. I remember that. Hell, I saw that in the theater. It's one of the only movies ever, only comedies I've ever seen in the theater. Like, yeah, that was Lin Shay. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Uh, this is even a little bit more out there than that, I would say. Just for like, because it's not for sexual purposes. There's no, it doesn't serve a purpose, I guess. There's no titillation. There's no disgust. It's just there to be there. Right. Like, you, trust me. Like, is nobody's going to sit there and be like, I got to rewind that. Get me some of that. No, not happening. So, but yeah, anybody that has Amazon Prime, it's on Amazon Prime for free for how long? Who knows? Because. Amazon has the worst streaming. I have no problem saying they have the worst because it's very inconsistent. It's not always easy to find what you're looking for unless you know the... It's not easy to go through like the horror section because it's like one good movie, 17 shit ones, one good movie, three of them specifically made on a $500 budget. It, like... It's all over all right, the place. But if we're going to get into that, I would say Amazon is light years ahead of Hulu in regards to the way they have their movies classified, at least. Because finding anything on Hulu is fucking... Makes me want I, to stab myself. I just had that experience two nights ago. I didn't realize Hulu redid their interface. And, like, they at least used to have a browse A through Z for, like, every genre. They don't have they that don't, anymore. Yeah. Right. Like, wh the one useful thing you had so I could find what I was looking for, gone. <sighs> Fuck you, Hulu. And now, not only is it not alphabetical, it's also not necessarily the complete... Like, you look at a list, it's not necessarily the complete list of everything they have. You can't find a list where it's every movie on Hulu at the moment. It's all... And the, it's this like is what we curated for list. you, suggested for you. Uh, you might like this. This month's tops pick. I'm like, Jesus Christ, at least put it alphabetical if you're going to fucking do shit like that. I just want to know who compiles these lists because... Like and and nobody like s checks them like no no this this just th doesn't belong here man. Those lists are made by the interns. That's why they're <laughs> the fucking problem. Oh, that Hulu made me very sad uh, when I yeah it was just two nights ago I was looking and I was like this is a mess and I gave up I almost want to unsubscribe from Hulu except I know in like two months I'll be back on it with South Park because I can't get Comedy Central. Yay. So. I don't know. That, that's how I feel about Fragile. I would definitely recommend it to anybody who's interested in it. A, a surprisingly decent ghost or haunted or whatever. It it works. It works better than I thought it would because I sat there and got... It, it wasn't what I thought it was. The The ghost wasn't. So. All right. Well, that is good to hear. Moving right. on from unplaced, un witting unmistakable boobs to boobs that are in there for 90% of the movie. <laughs> we have the autopsy of Jane Doe. All right. All right. And those boobs are actually really nice. So thank you, Kat. For <laughs> She's a very pretty girl. Uh, her name's like Olin, Owlin or something like that. Very unique first name. Ol Olwen? Olwen. Olwen. Olwen Catherine Kelly. So, I had never seen this, but I had heard only good things about it. You had seen this, and so you recommended it and suggested it for me. And, yeah, it was a really solid movie. Um, really good cast, really small cast. Um, very few locations. So, I mean, they basically locked down how to do a horror movie on a budget and then uh, just write a good, solid story to go along with it. And uh, uh, I wouldn't say it was scary scary 
you know, like it wasn't one of those movies where I woke up in the middle of the night and was fucking, uh, you know, crying myself to sleep like I was after I watched The Ring for the first time. But there were definitely a couple uh, pretty effective scenes. Uh, interesting mythology, you know, if they continue to go on to do another one. And uh, I will never, you know, hear that just that little uh, toe jingle from the uh, the toe uh, bell that they put on the corpses in the morgue ever again and not be a little freaked out. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not a big Emil Hirsch fan, but I think he's a d- decent actor. But I am a giant uh, Brian Cox fan, and he did a really good job in this movie. This was one of my favorite Brian Cox performances, and he's done a lot of great things. But the, I, I think I liked it because this fit an aging Brian Cox really well. He he nailed this role. I I, I really loved it. Um, that song, the the song, man. I I had to go and down get on YouTube and hell, I even posted on Facebook this. Yeah, morning. I saw you posted on there this morning. <laughs> Because <laughs> um, I, I rewatched, I watched all four movies that we were discussing last night. That's what I. That was my life yesterday. Was watching these four, and uh, like I knew I liked it, and then rewatching it, I'd forgotten like what the. Uh, I don't want to say twist, but I mean what you find out about Jane Doe. And I forgot, like I liked how how it was told. I I loved. One of the freakier parts, even though it wasn't freaky, is when they removed her skin and you saw, like, what was under her skin, I guess. Like, what was drawn. That was really cool. I, I loved I loved when, I think it was Emil Hirsch just trying to fucking escape. And, like, you know, the officer's like, we're trying to get you out. You just got to push the door open. And then, like, the officer starts singing the song. I, like, that moment was great for me. Probably my favorite moment of the whole that- movie. The um, yeah, just a lot of little stuff too, like the scene where they he finds the the cat and something's attacked it and it's in the the duct, and they bring it down and you can tell that like Brian Cox just loves this cat like it's it's his fucking cat and he fucking breaks the neck to put it out of his misery like that was a great scene, you know like Poor I like Stanley. I like the scene I like the scene with the girlfriend where she's like oh, I want to see it and you know he's like. The kid's like, you know, the normal, typical, no, 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 we got to respect him. And Brian Cox's like, no, fucking show her. See if she fucking freaks out after this kind of shit, you know? I, yeah, I love how he just fuck like, the whole time you're sitting there, you're waiting for Brian Cox to fuck with her, and he does, and it was so worth it. <laughs> uh, I really I like s- the scene with the um, the smoke, too, when they're in the hallway trying to get out after the the furnace starts billowing. And you hear the shit coming down the hallway towards them. Uh, yeah, I, hell, I even liked what, at the point when they like lock themselves in the room, the smaller room, and then th- there's like the two rooms, and yeah. like Brian Cox get hurt, and like they push the filing cabinet up against the door, and then he goes to check on his dad, and then he looks back out, and the filing cabinet's been pushed over. I loved. I don't want to say they were misdirections; they weren't necessarily misdirections, but it was all just to like mind fuck with them. And I, I guess my only, I have a question and it's kind of, kind of a spoiler. It's not a huge spoiler and I'm not going to feel bad for asking it, but if people are afraid of spoilers, skip the next three minutes. But like, how, how did she mind fuck them to attack the girlfriend? Do you, like that, that part was a little off to me. I felt, uh, wasn't that, if I remember correctly, like they heard the the toe tag or the toe bell coming down it, the, the hallway. Yeah, yeah, but how the hell did she make it down there to begin with? Uh, well, I think that was before the, the power went out. You know, so she went down, you know, looking for her boyfriend because he's late and was supposed to be uh, going to the movies with her. And that's when the Jane Doe started fucking with them. You know, so I, I'm assuming that Emma was already down there by that point. Uh, okay. And so she's, you know, they're walking. She's walking around looking for him, and all of a sudden, you know, gah, X to the chest. Yeah. Okay. I, I love how they kept it open for a sequel. Like, yeah, yeah. I'm shocked that they didn't make a sequel. Yet. 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 That's <laughs> the operative word in Hollywood. But here's the thing: like, if you make the sequel, like, 
I don't want them to make a sequel. That's that's the thing. Like, what are they going to do? Make the exact same discoveries that we did and show like flashbacks and ruin the whole experience? Like, that's what's left is to show flashbacks of her origin, right? Like, that's how you do the sequel. Either that, or you start with. Uh, I mean, you would have to do flashbacks at some point, but I mean, it looks like basically with the premise of like every family house, whatever she destroys, she gets herself a little closer to being alive again, possibly. So either that or start with her, you know, the, I could see something like where they're, you're hearing the noise from like a family killing themselves. And then, you know, it starts with her coming back to life and then it's, you know, what she does at that point. But let's not give Hollywood any ideas. Sometimes a movie should just stay a movie. Sometimes that is better, Lewis. But I'm going to take your, your word for that and you know, <laughs> their word for it, too. So. I, honestly, this is one of the best, un, like, best told mysteries in horror in the pacing in which they tell it to you. I, I don't... You know, horror usually just takes... like. They provide you a mystery, you find little bits and pieces, and then you have like this aha moment about an hour, hour and fifteen in where everybody like somebody like finally puts everything together instead of like a nice slow burn. I, I like the slow burn here much better because they slowly but surely, you know, get their shit together. Yeah, and slow burns work when something is written well and um like you said, they take their time. When when you slow burn and then try to burn something out at the very end, that's when you um tend to you know either it continues to work over the whole course of the thing or the the big push at the end is what uh, screws up the fact that you had a slow burn to get to that point. So but, I, I gotta say I'm looking at all right the dude who directed this also directed Troll Hunter, which. There's really no similarities between the two films, but I liked both films for very different reasons. And I'm also noticing one of the... Was it producer? No, one of the writers is Ian Goldberg, and I recognize the name because he's currently a producer, one of two, per, two of the main producers for Fear the Walking Dead when Fear the Walking Dead finally got shit together last season, in season four. So... Both guys are pretty good at what they do. Uh, the other thing I gotta say is like looking at the the director shit. He's doing uh, scary stories to tell in the dark that's coming out what a month or two. So that's giving me a little more hope too on how that's gonna turn out. Oh yes, I'm just uh, well that that's exciting. I'm looking at the cast for that. I'm seeing Dean Norris, who I like. Yeah, I, I saw the um. The, the trailer and I thought yeah it, both of them have looked good but I actually think it looks like it could be scary you know a scary scary movie rather than just like a scary movie a popcorn scary movie I guess would be the other term but yeah uh, to get back to Autopsy of Jane Doe I really liked it it was a really good choice I think like you said it was a good mystery and a good good pacing throughout uh, and good performances so thank you for that I would not rate it because my rating scale would be completely different than what Kent's is. But uh, I would say it was probably in my range like a B plus. B plus, maybe A minus. You know, I just want to take a moment. I want to take like 30 seconds to explain the rating scale just so people understand when I give a random number, it holds meaning. Here's the basic premise. If it's five or higher, I would rewatch it for enjoyment purposes. I have rewatched lower than five for review purposes or to show somebody just how shitty of a movie it is. But that's it. Like that that's the main premise is five or higher, I would rewatch it. If it's going above a seven, there's gotta be something a l there's gotta be a lot to it that I, I really like and you know obviously eights and I don't give anything higher than nine point two because there's no such thing as a fucking perfect ten movie. No no movie's perfect. But 9.2 seems very fair to me, plus, you know, it's gimmicky. Um, I don't give anything uh, below a 1 because, it, you know, it takes a lot to get a fucking movie made. Like, I don't care, like, how low budget it is. 
it's tough to get a fucking movie made. Like, no matter how shitty it is, it is difficult. So, with that being said, I have given lots of movies one point something. I've rarely given... I don't give much beyond an eight unless it's, you know, one of those, I don't know, top 50 movies maybe for me have reached that threshold. A lot of horror that I really like falls in the six to seven range. Um... Something like The Conjuring, for instance, I give like maybe a 7.1 or 2. Like, it takes a lot to get beyond the 7.5 and 8 range for me. So, that explains that. Okay. <laughs> Not confusing at all, Chris. Duh. Okay, to, to actually go back to something that you said earlier, just to... Was the... Uh, uh, Allie McPhee... Calista Flockhart wasn't in that, was she? Oh God, no! Yeah, that would have been that would have been weird. <laughs> I, my my friend Amanda and I we were bored, went to Video World, couldn't find a movie that we really wanted to see from new releases. I was like, "Hey, you want to watch a porno instead?" She's like, "Sure." So we went in there, you know, and it's like late teenagers, early 20 year olds, still kind of giggling because internet porn really was in its infancy. So porno rental was still uh, an option. And we came across Allie McPhee and uh, there was another one that's even far filthier. I don't even know if I want to say it. So yeah, we rented two pornos and had a very good laugh. That sounds probably more interesting than the movie was. I think it was like a, the instructor's guide to anal and it was like a, a 80 minute movie and like it was really hilarious they had like an instructor it, it was really fucking funny so that's how I spent my early 20s watching really funny porno and horror movies how am I spending my late 30s watching really funny porno and horror movies things have not changed uh, it's good to hear that there's some stability in your life. Yeah, it is good. All right, so I believe, if I recall correctly then, to continue moving on, the very next movie that we chose, was it Lights Out for you? It was Lights Out. All right, I'm interested in hearing what you thought about this one, because this was one of my pleasant surprises from 2016. You know, I remember it came out relatively close to the same time as Don't Breathe and... I think it got overshadowed by all the hype that that one had. So let me know what you think. Don't breathe more like don't watch ever. That was my joke. Um, I never saw the original short film to lights out and uh, it seems very split whether a lot of people will say, just watch the, the original short film and avoid all of this. And some people really like this. Um, I will preface this by saying, I am not a fan of jump scares. Um, I used to, but now jump scares a lot of times give me bad headaches. Um, something about the jolting of my fucking head and or neck gives me the fucking headaches. So that's why I'm not a fan of it anymore. That's why like, I usually you know, shit all over Insidious, despite you know the story being good. So with that prefaced, the story was adequate. Like, um, It was a good use of... Uh, shadow entity, shadow monster, shadow, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, Diana. Yeah, I have no idea what you would actually classify her as. Um, I mean, because she was a person, and, I mean, then she wasn't. Uh, I actually, you know, a lot of people shit on the backstory of Diana, and I, I actually thought the backstory to Diana was one of the more interesting parts of this film. Um... I didn't know that Maria Bello was in this. Had I known that, I would have watched this probably a lot sooner. I, I love Maria Bello. And I thought she did a great fucking job with this. Um, I know she's not always great, but I do like a lot of her work. Uh, except for Big Driver. That movie sucked dick. And that was a Stephen King one, too. But it was on Lifetime, I think. I haven't seen that, so I will take your word for it. Oh, absolutely avoid that at all costs. Um, all right, so I took some notes here, and <laughs> early on, one of the funniest things here was like the opening scene where Esther sees 
the shadow being. She goes to talk to Paul. Paul's on the phone. And he's just, like, brushing her off because, you know, s- something being in the place that you work at where there's only supposed to be two of you is less important than your phone conversation. Okay, I get it if the phone conversation is really important. But here's the fucking kicker. He returns to the phone call and he says, I'll be home in an hour. Yep. Okay. Bye. Like he couldn't have accomplished that and then just walked with Esther. No. So what the fuck? Right? Yeah. I mean, like anytime that anybody, including dudes, has come to me when they worked for me and said, hey, I don't feel comfortable. Can you do something? You know. I go and fucking do it just, you know, just to be a good boss, not even to be, you know, somebody who, like, cares about other people's, you know, well-being and safety. So, yeah, I mean. <laughs> I mean, just yeah. to c- carry on conversation that says, I will be home in an hour. Yep. Okay. Bye. Like, you could do that. Then just go with the person. <sighs> All right. Um, I like the use of the whole lighting thing, but... In- in all fairness, in order to do this movie properly, you have to have the lights do its thing, but I, I guess I'll ask this question, even though I, I ask it later on in my notes here. Did Diana have the ability to just turn lights off? Like, she had had some kind of ability to do that, right? Like, to fuck with the lights? If you were talking, I cannot hear you. Sometimes it seemed like she did, sometimes uh, it didn't. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen this. Um, I mean, I would say that, like, if she did, probably the more smaller or, like, uh, uh, isolated light sources would seem to be the ones that she could fuck with. Like, if I'm trying to remember, like, maybe back in the, the warehouse, you know, at, towards the beginning. It, it, it was just, it was overly convenient in how the lights could go on and off at times. And once again, I know that they had to have it for <clears throat> the purposes of this film. You have to have light tricks and all that stuff. But I, I wish the writing was a little bit more crisp as to why, you know, a storm's happening. So lights are flickering on and off. That makes sense to me. Kind of like an autopsy of James Doe where, you know, there's a storm going on. So shit's happening. There's no storm going on here. Like, just add the storm, and I think a lot more stuff can be forgiven, in in my opinion. Um, very disappointed that uh, Rebecca was in the shower and there was no nudity, but thank God, you know, PG-13 horror. Yay. Uh, once again, I love batshit crazy Maria Bello. Um, if, if you can give me more of that, I, I'm all in. Uh Mm, let's see here. I like the posters in Rebecca's uh, place. She had a ghost poster and Avenged Sevenfold, two bands that I personally enjoy. And I actually have a ghost candle, which made me like kind of happy. Like, hey, I have a light source with ghosts. It kind of goes with the movie. I'm stretching things, but whatever. Uh, I like the carving of Diana on the floor, and then it went back to Rebecca's past with the painting like the little drawing picture whatever um really hated the paranormal activity of martin getting dragged please can we stop using fucking entities dragging people like stop it just stop that stuff please um rebecca in the bathroom at one point lights start to flicker what does she do just keeps hanging out in there like i still gotta find what something rather than get the fuck out of there that <sighs> typical horror movie moment. Um, I think Diana has the ability to teleport faster than uh, Daenerys on uh, Drogon. Uh, I was impressed with that. And um, let's see. Oh, horror movie cops. Always great. Somebody tells them something. No, no, we got it. And then they die. That I love horror cop cliches. They never get old for me. And I felt the ending was a tad obvious, and I I know it's spoilerific, but if you don't realize how to get rid of Diana, like, you're not paying attention, I guess. Would you say that's fair? Yeah, no, I would say that's fair. Um, One thing I liked, I liked the boyfriend. I liked the relationship, too. I didn't think that was a typical horror movie relationship that you would get. Normally it would be a lot more cliched, I think. 
Or, you know, he would be like, oh, yeah, I believe you, I believe you. Here, let me call you the psychiatrist to fucking take care of you. Kind of shit. Like, I have a note in here somewhere that Brett is really, like, the most likable person in the whole movie. I, think. I was like, holy shit, somebody who believed her from the fucking get-go. I was like, that's, that's refreshing in a horror movie. I liked, like... I liked like he was quick thinking too, like when the scene where Diana goes to go after him and he's got the fucking car thing. Yeah, he, he was he was a well written character, and like he was a smart, well written character. Which is, it's weird that they had this like really well written character in, in a movie with a lot of uh, cliches. I guess, I guess you would say. Actually, I thought Maria Bello's character was also written brilliantly. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't by no means was it a great movie, but I'm trying to. I mean, like again, like I was saying, putting it into context of when it came out, I was surprised by how much I liked it, and like you know, for uh, Diana kind of being a little bit cliche, she was also in a lot of ways unique as a a, a character. You know, I'm like like again, like you said, like what the hell do you classify her as? All I know is I preferred, I preferred her to the descent, and those fucking things. Fuck I mean, she's <laughs> she's not a ghost. She's not a demon. You know, she used to be a person. Well, what what is she just like a fucking mental projection? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, a ghost is the closest thing that you could see, but she's really not because she can cause. Uh, she she has powers and. It, I assume that she can teleport. I think that's a thing because she got places that she should have uh, been I'm able a, to. I'm assuming that you know, just she can move through any shadow, you know, or, or darkness, or you know. Yeah, honestly, you know, I know this is really off topic, but this would make for a great video game idea. I could see, like this being like a level, or like a repeating like enemy in like a. Like, if they ever make The Evil Within 3, I think that would be a, a cool way. I mean, especially since they've shown that they can handle um, different types of horror within the same game. Yeah, and that'd be absolutely fucking terrifying and make me not want to play it, and yet I probably still would. I mean, um, I start thinking about the fact that they gave you, like, limited number of matches and that to, like, burn the bodies, and then having to go through the dark and use your matches to get rid of this creature that can attack you that you can't kill. That, yeah, that would be an interesting mechanic. Sure. Yeah, it's it's sad to me that I feel like last year on the in the Nine Deuce Horror Group, somebody we were supposed to actually do Lights Out, and I put it off, put it off, put it off, and we never did it. And now in hindsight, I really wish I would have forced myself to, to do this because I, I think it could have been fun... A fun blog for everybody back when people. Oh, it was um, it was one of the ones that we had as a choice on, and nobody picked it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, nobody followed up today on on my question, so I don't think anybody pays attention anymore, and that's okay. So, fuck uh, YouTube. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, overall, like, uh, I don't know if I'd I'd give this like a. See, my my fondness for Maria Bello keeps making me want to up this score, but I'm probably going to be I I I'm happy with like a six point three to six point four range. Like I I liked it. I would watch it again, but I I, I can't give it a six point five. I definitely can't do that. I, I'll say that's fair. I would I would put it at like solid B rating and not. B movie as in you know like a B movie but just like a B rating it was um decent production values you know some interesting concepts some good characters but yeah some of it was fairly generic and cliche uh oh I mean the one thing I'll say too is that the kid wasn't bad for as far as kid actors go either so Martin was yeah he was really now now if we could have replaced him with the kid, <laughs> the screaming kid in the Baba Duke I would have liked to have seen how that movie goes but that's a whole other hypothetical <laughs> thing. Um, yeah, it, you know, it's interesting. So far, uh, the first three movies, none of them really could or should have a sequel. 
I know the last one actually did have a sequel, but it you know normally when we discuss horror movies, usually there's fucking sequels involved, and these first three didn't really have. I mean, is there really a way to do a lights out two? I don't. I don't think there is. I mean, you'd have to make a stretch and explain things way more than what what got explained in this one. I mean, that was the other thing I like. Like for for all they told you who and what Diana was, there never really was an explanation for how. Do you know what I mean? It almost kind of reminded me, and I know this is a big leap of faith here, but kind of remind me of uh, Shocker and how that dude came to be whatever the fuck he was. Yeah, just like, just happened. Yeah, like, there really wasn't a great explanation, but you just kind of have to accept it for the rest of the movie to make sense. Now, here's a question for you to uh, to kind of wrap up this shit, but what do you think of Billy Burke as, like, a supporting actor in movies like this? Like, do you think he adds something, or do you think at this point, like, that part could have been played by anybody and they could have saved some of the budget by casting somebody slightly less well-known or even significantly less well-known. Uh, I All right, so I know Billy Burke is Paul, and I'm trying to think what else I know him from. I'm, I'm looking it up now. He was in the Twilight movies, which does not help me at all. What else would I know him from? Uh, I mean, the other thing I really remember in large part was that, uh, what was it, um, Little Red or whatever, the friggin' the, Red Riding Hood? Yeah, sorry, that one. Um, it's been in a bunch of, like, TV shows. Um, not, uh, I, yeah, uh, Untraceable. Yeah, that was another big one for him. He was the uh, kind of love interest in that one. I'm looking through, and I, honestly, I've missed most. Like, even Along Came a Spider, I remember watching once, but I don't remember it. Um, but judging by the fact that he has name value, I mean, as long as he didn't cost much, it was fine. But I felt his his role in and of itself, like how they treated it, at, like my first complaint, I, I hated how he was written. So... I don't know, you don't get a name guy just to give a poorly written part to. I, I, like, you could have put any schmuck to do that particular part, but I guess if they had money or somebody really liked Billy Burke for something, I, I guess you'd go for it if you got the money. I, don't, I mean, I guess my, I mean, my other part, too, is like you said, the part was shitty. Like, what kind of dad would walk out and leave your fucking kids in a family with, like, a mom that fucking, obviously that fucking crazy? Yeah, yeah. I, I, he wasn't a good person. He like he was a shitty father. He was a shitty boss. He was just shitty, and then he lasted for all five minutes. Uh, so did they contact him? And be like, hey, we got a part. You're gonna play a real shithead. You you down with that? We'll pay you. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that was probably just like, hey, we got a part for you. It's some money. <laughs> Take it. You need the work. Uh, yeah, I, I I guess that's fair. Uh, I don't know. I, I'd like to see him in in more things, but like I said, everything I just looked at is stuff I really am not terribly interested in, to be perfectly honest. I'd rather actually see like more of Brett. I don't know if he's been in anything else. I'm checking and not, him. Not out. really. It looks. I think just a couple of TV things. That, yeah, small. But yeah, <laughs> I, I'd agree. He was. Um, he was. Uh, he was surprising for me. He was and, a male evacuee number two in I Am Legend. <laughs> So, All right. Do we have anything else we would like to add to Lights Out? Nah, I think it's a another one of those one and dones. So. All right. So that's Lights Out on Lights Out, which brings us finally to Mirrors. Uh, I had never seen this. I'm glad I've watched it. It was kind of a mixed bag for me, though. Um, not not in a bad way. Like again, like I said, I'm glad I watched it. Um, but like I find. There were parts that were just okay. Parts that were really good. And then it had one of the most disturbing fucking deaths I've seen in a movie in a long fucking time. Gross as shit. Amy? Yeah, I was like, holy shit, that is fucking blatantly... And it seemed to me to almost violate the way everything worked. But we'll get into that in a second. 
Uh, I really liked Kiefer in it. I like the fact that it dealt with the fact that, yeah, a lot of first responder jobs, and they gloss over this all the time in TVs and movies, it's, it's very rare that they get into it and deal with it. Like, taking a life if you're not used to it, or getting shot, you know, if you're not in as used to that as well, fucking leaves PTSD. I was like, wow, they're, you know, they're going there with this dude. Uh, on the other hand, um, like, as hot as she is, Paul Patton, I think, could have been played by anybody in this movie, and it wouldn't have really made made a difference. Um, Jason Fleming, like, interesting hearing him talk with a Brooklyn accent, but again, I think it could have been anybody. wouldn't have really made a difference. Uh, but yeah, like, overall, the uh, the premise is pretty fucking scary. They had some really cool special effects. Um a nice twist at the ending. So, I mean, uh, it wasn't a, a horrible movie. It wasn't a, a great movie. I would say it was a good movie. Uh, for me, I, I will say, I thought the first half was better than the second half. W- without a doubt for me. Um, it was almost one of those movies that the more you know, the less fun it becomes, even though you got to eventually explain it. it. Like, I like nobody believing him. Uh, you know, kind of added to his paranoia and, you know, as you said, the PTSD, for instance. Um, I also, I don't know. I understand that they probably did it to show that, you know, Kiefer's character wasn't always great to his wife at points. But, like, she was not willing to listen to him at all. Like, she was just kind of a bitch the first, like, two times we meet her. Like, he shows up he gives this kid fucking birthday gift, and she's like, well, why are you here? You didn't call. He's like, well, every time I call, you don't pick up the phone, and she's still mad at him. It's like, well, how can he, like, kind of put him in a corner, right? Like, like I, they, I, they haven't done anything to establish what their relationship is, so she just, like you said, she comes off straight, straight as a bitch. It's like, that's, like, hey, we're still married. You know, I, he's still my kid. You know, no matter what you want to say, I'm going to have some kind of visitation rights. So if you're not returning my calls and not allowing me to visit my kids, why are you having a problem if I come over on his birthday to bring him a birthday present? Yeah, I, I, I which I don't know. Maybe they did that to make Kiefer's character more likable. But I, if anything, it didn't make him more likable. It just made Amy come off more as a bitch. Even though, like, I'm sure there was stuff from the past that would have merited it perhaps but they didn't show it to us so it just made her come off like a bitch yeah, i mean it's, it seems like here's a dude who got shot doing his job as a police officer uh you know he's going through issues and here's a wife who just doesn't give a fuck or you know we haven't seen enough to you know know whether or not she gives a fuck but that's just the way she's coming off right now right like Later on, you know, we find that he probably, you know, he had a drinking problem. Okay, we get it, but we didn't get to see it, and it was just a, it was a bad introduction. Yeah, you should have, you should have mentioned the drinking problem before you threw that kind of fucking characterization in. Right. That could have been fixed in editing real easily. Did Did you really like the, uh, the explanation for her? like the whole schizophrenia and how what was it Essaker, Anna Essaker? You know, like we find out all about her past and stuff. Did that work for you or no? Um, yeah, I, I think they did the best of what they could. But again, like you said, it was one of those things where, um, you know, the more they explain, the kind of dumber and not necessarily dumber, but you know, the idea got. You know, like I have more of a problem believing that, you know, when the movie came out in two thousand eight that, you know, like, people doing just a Google search for Essaker wouldn't be able to find any information out, and it would take two separate police searches to fucking find something. Like, they wouldn't have found, you know, there was a girl who died named Essaker back in, you know, 1950s in, you know, the very first fucking cop search. Um, But again, like, some really inventive stuff. Uh, I liked, like, the, uh, the scratching on the mirrors. I like, like when he goes to try to fucking break them and, you know, it, uh, it's completely impervious. And then he's like, look, I'll shoot. And he shoots. I was, I thought like to me, I would have been like, 
shooting a mirror outside my house probably isn't going to be the same as shooting like a giant supernatural mirror inside the fucking crazy ass scary place I'm fucking patrolling every <laughs> night. That whole thing cracked me up. Like he's just like, here, let me show you. Pulls out gun in the middle of day outside, just shoots up this mirror. He's like, oh, that didn't work at all. It's like the cops should be on their way any time now, dude. Like, <laughs> so so here's my question. You know, we're shown in the beginning that in order for them to get you, you have to be able to see some kind of reflection, like a mirror or something. Um, and then, you know, that seems to be the case every everywhere else in the movie except for the one death scene in the bathroom. But, like, when Paul Patton comes upon her daughter being having her throat cut and she picks her up and gets her away from the mirror, you know, her daughter's throat stops being cut. So how come Amy Smart isn't looking at the mirror but her reflection in the mirror is able to completely rip her jaw off. Like, I didn't get how, you know, I thought it was a cool scene, but like later on when I was thinking about it, I'm like, I don't get how that works functioning around, you know, the internal consistency, logical consistency in the movie. It it was wildly inconsistent. They probably knew it. And they probably also were like, this scene is going to be rewatched and talked about when anybody talks about mirrors. Probably the first thing that comes up is, the Amy Smart scene, and I can't quite blame them for keeping it, even though it's illogical because of how they showed it later on. I I, I completely 100% understand and agree, but in all fairness, would you have cut that scene out, or would no, you have somehow no, like have, found a way to modify it? Maybe I don't maybe know. just maybe just flip the mirror around so it's facing her. I don't know. Or or maybe like have another mirror like on the other side of the room, like a little hand mirror just hang, hanging up or something. Just something to add a little something to it to make it logical, I guess, could have worked. Yeah, I mean, I think the only other thing that would have been scarier than what actually happened would have been, been if she had been forced to see what happened and then had it happen to her. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, yeah, no, that was definitely fucking brutal. I wasn't prepared for that after you know what we had had so far. Um, and but though I do have to put up with you, like this is another scene in a bathtub that we did not get boobs. Can't I know? Seriously, we've, the we've only we've seen boobs. her boobs before. So I mean, it's not like she had anything to hide. The so well, I gave you a movie with nonstop tits. You gave me a movie with tits that I don't ever want to see again. And yet we had lights out. We had mirrors. Both. Well, we did see her ass. At least we saw Amy's ass. That's true. Okay, so, but, but uh, maybe maybe next month we just pick boob movies. I don't know. <laughs> All right, Slumber Party Massacre one, two, and three. Go. God, those are great movies. Um, did you did you like the ending where Kiefer's on the I don't know alternative plane? Yeah, it wasn't bad. It was a, it was a nice twist. I mean, I think they. I don't know if they really sold it enough to to make you wonder what was happening i mean because you know you see the shit collapse and then the next thing you know he's crawling out you know, if they had i don't know maybe it let the you had seen everybody show up first and see how fucked up the building was and then he crawled out it might have worked a little bit better but no it wasn't it wasn't bad it was cool it showed you know like where all the handprints on the inside of the mirrors were coming from only thing I, I guess I would have liked is for him to try to interact with like his family to have that aha moment first. I, I, I don't know. It, it just left me not feeling... I didn't feel as much sympathy as I wanted to at the end. Like He was a sympathetic guy, but his ending was shitty. I think if they would have just had it where his family was there on the scene, and when he comes out and like you, know, you have the cop, co- cops there or whatever... I think it would have just added a little bit more impact to drive the point home. It would have, it would have been sadder if he would have tried like, you know, hugging his kid or talking to his kid or something and got no reaction. Just my point perspective. And I also want to say, don't watch mirrors too. Not good at all. Or what? I mean, Um, does it even connect at all? I don't remember how well it connects. I remember the, the characters weren't that good. The, I mean, Nick Stahl is your fucking lead, right? Yeah, I'm not a big Nick Stahl fan. Right. And it's it's more of the 
same boat. It's another one of those movies that didn't need... There was no need for a sequel. Uh, that, that, I, I think that's more the problem than anything else. There's just no need for a fucking sequel on so many of these movies. And it's not like it did good in the theater. I don't even know if it went to the theater. Do you remember if it went theater? I don't think it did, no. Oh, I, I mean, I, I guess, you know, that that's the whole point is... <clears throat> I guess you bastardize it to make a little extra money, but it's seriously only a little extra money, and you've killed, you know, part of your legacy, part of the creation of the original. So it, it does bum me out. Um, and I, I remember watching it, and I remember just thinking, "God, this is shit." And I, I remember watching the whole thing, but pff, you could give me five different scenarios, and I wouldn't be able to pick out which one was the main point of that story. <laughs> So, very forgettable. Gotcha. All right. I mean, is there anything else you would like to add into talking about these movies? No, oh, because... Let's give, uh, let's give a... What's your rating for Mirrors? Uh, Mirrors, Mirrors gets a, a solid 6.7, 6. I think, for me. Because I really like the concept and I really like the first hour. Yeah, I would say it was this was probably between like a B and a B plus for me. You know, if I had to give it a numeric grade, it'd probably be like a solid eighty three, eighty four, somewhere it, in that range. The acting was really good. Like Kiefer was perfect for this role. Like I'm not sure who you find that's going to be better for that role. Like he nailed that role, and that was a big thing for me. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are a couple other people it could have been, but you know, I just like Kiefer. Kiefer, I've liked him. In almost every single thing he's done. So, I mean, he's just... He was an actor's son who became a good actor in his own right without having to just rely on daddy's name. And they have such different styles. I mean, I love the Donald, but... Uh, you know, I, I love both of them for very different reasons. Uh, both, yeah, very good actors, incredible actors for me. So... Yeah, basically, uh, just let the fans know what we'll do when we wrap this up. We're going to do the second one, and during the second one, Chris and I are going to pick two films for each of us to watch from our list. So that's why we're not naming them right now. Yep. So with that being said, I think we'll wrap up this first podcast. Uh, we'll be back in just a little bit if you guys wanted to continue listening straight up and directly otherwise uh, we'll talk to you later internet peace out